Indiana Governor Eric Holk addressing Hoosiers on the state's actions in response to the coronavirus crisis. We'll right Let's listen in. Dr. Lindsay Weaver, uh, and if you could give us the, the numbers on the ground and what's occurred over the weekend, we'd appreciate it. So today we reported 583 additional cases of COVID-19 in Indiana, which brings us to 20,507 as the total number of Hoosiers known to have COVID. We also saw 19 additional confirmed deaths. To date, 1,151 Hoosiers have died of COVID-19. And another 113 are believed to have died from this disease based on their symptoms, x-rays, and other diagnostics, but did not have a positive COVID test on record. Our ICU bed and ventilator capacity are holding steady at just over 45% of ICU beds and nearly 81% of ventilators available. We will be keeping an eye on these numbers as we move through the phase reopening that Governor Holcomb has outlined. Another number we are watching is the number of Hoosiers tested for COVID-19, which stands at just over 113,000 and is more than double the number of tests we reported just one month ago. As Dr. Box and the governor have discussed, expanded testing is going to be a critical part of our work to safely reopen Indiana and protect our most vulnerable citizens. That's why I'm excited to share the new map showing testing locations around the state. The map is posted on our www.coronavirus.in.gov website. It includes ISDH drive through clinics, hospitals, local health departments, and other community-based testing. It shows both mobile and fixed testing sites. You can click on a link and find the location, the hours, and the testing criteria for each of those locations. This map is a living document and will be updated as sites are added or closed. More than 100 sites are on the map, including the first 20 sites that will host testing through our new large-scale statewide testing program. Registration for those 20 sites open today and can be accessed at the link or the phone number listed on the slide. The website is lhi.care forward slash COVID testing or by phone at 888-634-1123. This is how any Hoosier who has symptoms of COVID-19 or is a close contact of a positive case can be tested for free. We announced this plan last week, and as it becomes fully operational, we should be testing more than 100,000 Hoosiers every month. These first 20 sites are opening on Wednesday. When you go to the portal, you will report your symptoms or exposure and then be assigned an appointment. We are finalizing details for the other 30 state testing sites. This map shows which counties will host the additional locations. As the opening dates and addresses are confirmed, we will share that with you. We continue to offer ISDH drive through clinics throughout the state the, each week, and this week we are in East Chicago, Plymouth, Lafayette, Newcastle, and Seymour. Thank you, Dr. Weaver. Um, Peter, a lot of things were put on hold for a lot of Hoosiers. Uh, your agency, the Bureau of Motor Vehicles, is one where Hoosiers intersect with more than a lot of our large agencies even, but you want to talk about where we are today and how you see us moving forward, especially with that customer interaction. Absolutely. Thank you very much. My name is Peter Lacey. I'm the uh, commissioner of the Indiana Bureau of Motor Vehicles, and we're excited to today talk about how we're entering in our phase two of serving Hoosiers. You might recall that beginning in April, we started working with the commercial driver's license community to make sure that we were providing commercial driver's license, not just to the truckers who supply uh, the stores around the state, but also to the agricultural community to make sure that we got our fields planted on time this year. We were able to do that through 15 locations around the state and service more than 1,700 appointments during that time and really felt like we provided a critical need to the state. But in entering phase two, we have an intent to provide that same opportunity to all Hoosiers to do the transactions with the BMV that you can only do in a branch, that you cannot do on mybmv.com, at any of our kiosks, through the mail, or through our telephones. We are adding 40 locations to our map and are, are trying to put a branch within one hour of every Hoosier in the state so that they can make appointments at the BMV. You can make an appointment 
either through mybmv slash mybmv.com, in.gov slash bmv, or through our contact center, 888-692-6841. To better serve Hoosiers, we're gonna have extended hours, and we are gonna be open Monday through Saturday, 9 to 5 p.m., to make sure that we can take care of Hoosiers. There are nine transactions that we've identified that must be done through a branch. And when you go onto our portal or contact our contact center, they're gonna to try to pre-screen you to those nine transactions so that we can make sure we're serving as many Hoosiers as possible. Governor, I'm excited to say since announcing this on Friday, we've had over 20,000 appointments already made with the BMV and 17,000 of those are just in this upcoming week. But part of opening ourselves up to the public brings up the fact that we need to be intentional and deliberate for, con for the concern of protecting not only the Hoosiers that are coming to visit us, but our employees that are gonna be servicing those Hoosiers across the state. And we wanna make sure everyone knows that we are employing CDC guidelines as we reopen our branches. What does that mean for you? First of all, we are only operating by appointment only, so you need to go on to in.gov slash BMV or call the contact center to make an appointment. Our lobby chairs will be positioned at least six feet apart. We will only be utilizing CSR terminals at every other terminal so that we can have social distancing between our CSRs or those people taking tests. And finally, we're gonna have a 30 minute barrier between each customer so we can make sure that we wipe down all hard services between customers coming into our branch. This is only our, our phase two, and we're following the governor's guidelines and his advice on a phased approach to opening, but our intent is to have all branches open before Memorial Day so that we are well functioning before the June 2nd primary election. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Rachel, before we get to, to Q&A, let me just um, put a shout out. This week happens to be a national uh, teacher appreciation week, and obviously we're seeing teachers here in the state of Indiana go way up and beyond the normal call of duty, facing challenges like uh, we've never faced in our lifetimes before. They have acted quickly, they have been nimble and agile, they have built virtual curriculum, they have stayed connected with students, whether it be at a central location in the community or to the homes themselves. They're doing parades to, to recognize uh, student achievement, just a whole list A to Z. And one of those, uh, Missy Trent up in Culver Community Schools, um, Northern Indiana came to the rescue of, and this is just one example of so many. It was hard to narrow, I was starting to look at um, everything teachers were doing around the whole state of Indiana, but she found a student who was um, uh, potentially um, um, uh, positive for corona, for the coronavirus, COVID-19, potentially at one point. And, and she got connected to that student and to the family. She was uh, made sure while that student was quarantined that their family had money to pay a heating bill of all things. She then took the family a electric heater. She then in the community raised $500 to pay that next electric uh, or that heating bill. And so this was in, on top of what was going on in terms of instruction. This was about that whole student and their well-being. And so she's just, Missy is, representing 78,000 teachers scattered across the whole state of Indiana who obviously deserve more than our gratitude um, for what they're doing, how they are turning and burning um, during this uh, last couple months to, to make sure ends meet in more, ways than, in more ways than one. And oh, by the way, once a teacher, always a teacher, uh, I've come to learn in life, and the Indiana Retired Teachers Association also has stepped back up and uh, set up a hotline, if you will, to help students with uh, instructional. It's, it's a, a tutorial, if you will, if you're struggling with your homework, or if you have questions, it's for the students and for the parents. Um, by the way, it's open uh, weekly on every weekday, one to five. Uh, the number is 877-45-STUDY, 877-45-STUDY. And because it's a, a hotline, um, teachers are calling in from all over the country, actually, not just in Indiana. Uh, but we have one uh, so-called teacher, Nancy, I'll just say Nancy in Florida, uh, who has helped a student uh, and the parents in that household. And she's 
She, you know, hasn't taught math in years, so we've come to learn. Um, but the student was struggling with a particular problem, and the parent was struggling with that particular problem, as we can all relate to. Uh, and Nancy, although she hasn't taught math in some number of years, was able to ask all the right questions and get that student through. And so um, I've got some teachers who are retired to some other states too. So Don in Arizona, I'm calling you out. You can call that hotline, 877-45-STUDY. Uh, and you can, again, help uh, students here in Indiana make sure they stay on course. And with that, uh, Rachel, we'll go right to Q&A. Meredith with WLFI. Hello, Meredith. Good afternoon. Hi. How are you, Governor? Great. Thank you. Yourself? Uh, I'm not too bad. Staying healthy, hopefully, like everyone else. So my question is um, actually for the MV. So obviously, you guys have had an influx of appointments already. Lots of Hoosiers are going to be renewing their licenses. Maybe some Hoosiers need to uh, register a new car. Is there any concern that... Many of these Hoosiers aren't going to be able to do that in time. And, you know, obviously, if you don't have your car registered, you could end up getting a ticket. Is there any talk of possibly, you know, expanding that window a little bit more, considering this is going to be kind of a phase reopen? Sure. First, I'd like to remind everyone that expiration dates have been extended by the governor's executive order number nine through the 22nd of May. So as of right now, there is no need uh, to feel a pressure either on a driver's license or on an expiration plate of a, of a license plate to go into the BMV right now because of that order. And we are looking at the data and we'll be working with the governor to extend that as we get all branches back. Open. Abdul Hakim Shabazz, Indy Politics. Good afternoon, Abdul. Good afternoon, Governor. Just took me a second to find the unmute button. Big shocker, I know. Um, a couple of things, Governor. Uh, first of all, uh, the response this week to your trip uh, down in Nashville at the governor's residence in Brown County. Uh, Democrats say uh, you took a vacation. Uh, the protesting folks are saying that, hey, this is Eric Holcomb saying, do as I say, not as I do. Yeah. Uh, does, this, does this hurt your credibility and efforts to get Hoosiers to hunker down, do all the things that we need to do to you know, get to that July 4th deadline? And uh, the quick follow-up is I had a lot of Hoosier businesses that, hey, I don't know, where do I fall in on the governor's executive order? Where can I get uh, more details, maybe some things that might be a little bit more uh, English than in the you know, governmental lawyers speak in the universe, a lot of us folks kind of walk in. Well, first things first, uh, no, it's not do as I say, not as I, or do as I say, not as I do. Um, it was a reminder for me that six second photo op, I went in to um, frequent a local um, dining establishment. I'd like to make sure that I'm doing my part while they're weathering this storm. And it was an unforced error, completely my fault. Uh, I actually looked at a bench down in, um, Brown County, right by that particular restaurant, and it had a quote on the bench that should have been assigned to me that, get your mask out. I take a mask everywhere I go. I had the mask in the car. Uh, and the quote on that bench from Abe Martin is, there's too many folks confusing temptation with opportunity. And it was a beautiful, beautiful day this past weekend when I went in to buy, uh, get my, our dinner for my wife and I. Uh, that is no excuse. I should have had that mask on. I thought I was going to be in there for 30 seconds and paying uh, to get my bag of feed, so to speak, my, my dinner, and then walk out. I ended up, was asked if I would take a picture uh, with the cashier and her daughter, and I did. And at that point, I should have marched myself out, got in my car, got the mask, should have wore it in, by the way, but got the mask, and then took the photo. Um, no one, Abdul, has been harder on myself than myself uh, over this past weekend, because that would have been the absolute ideal, perfect opportunity to take that picture properly social distanced with a mask on. It would have been the exact photo that if you would have taken a photo at a lot of other events when I am wearing my mask, made the mistake uh, of walking in a restaurant and picking up, uh, picking up my dinner without having the mask on. So now, having said that, um, this should be a reminder, not just for me, to break old bad habits. Uh, this should be a mind reminder for everyone, especially folks who are voluntarily um, seeking to break uh, the recommend or the rules or the recommendations. Again, wearing a mask is a recommendation, something that we highly, highly recommend. I'll be 
um, subscribing to it now 100% of the time, not just 99% of the time. Uh, secondly, Joe, you might want to, uh, General Counsel, Joe, you might want to speak to the executive order. We sent out Abdul, um, uh, we, well, actually, we solicited recommendations from various sectors, um, including the Indiana State Chamber of Commerce, including the NFIB, including the manufacturers. If you're not a member of a specific association or a member where you can get the information from them as well, we stand ready to answer any specific question that's not detailed in the back of our backontrack.in.gov. If, if you think it's too general, uh, we can certainly, this office, certainly answer any specific question you might have. Joe? Yeah, I think the governor says it very well. You know, we put the executive order together. It is, uh, we try to put it in, in plain English as much as possible. We had the back on track document that is uh, available online at backontrack.in.gov. Obviously that, you know, it's very difficult to capture every question um, and answer every question that could come up in a complex situation like this. But as the governor said, we are certainly available if there are areas of uncertainty or where there are questions where we can answer those as they come forward. So we're available to do that as needed. Rachel, uh, before I probably should have kicked the first one over um, to Dr. Weaver, I was looking at Brigadier General Lyles and I felt like when Abdul asked that first question, I should drop and give, give him 20 uh, or in basketball, do some more line laps. But um, you're, you're sitting right to my left here and you, and you watched me go into a restaurant or read about me going in a restaurant without a mask on. Uh, you wanna speak to why we are recommending Hoosiers, including myself, to wear a mask uh, when around others. Yeah, and, and honestly, I think th this is when the hard work starts, right? It's easy to avoid other people when, when we're staying home, but you go out and I almost made a mistake myself and ran into a friend at the grocery store and I wanted to run up and, and give her a hug and, and do my, my normal greeting. But again, this is where the hard work starts, right? We want to protect others around us. And so just that constant reminder to ourselves and to each other to wear a mask, to keep that social distancing, try and break those old habits. And that's how we're really going to be able to continue to move through all these phases and, and open up more and more. Thank you. Marcus Green, WDRB Louisville. Hello, Marcus. Good afternoon. Hi, Governor. Can you hear me? I can, loud and clear. Thank you. Uh, the presidents of Greater Louisville, Inc., the Chamber of Commerce for Louisville and a number of Southern Indiana counties said today that Kentucky and Indiana have what she calls disjointed reopening plans. And she's calling on you and Governor Bashir to identify coordinated solutions between the two states. One, what is your response to this concern? And do you believe Indiana's plan adequately weighed the needs of counties and bi-state metro areas that may have businesses that operate in two states? Yes, I do. Um, we too, uh, in addition to soliciting uh, input from various business businesses and their organizations throughout the whole state of Indiana, we were in receipt, we have, um, input from one Southern Indiana who worked with across the river um, with entities in Louisville and beyond. And so we absolutely did put eyes on what all those recommendations were for a smart reopening, understanding that some counties in those areas are different than others. Uh, but, but the coordinated word that you use is right. We coordinated in the sense that we were collaborating for the past few weeks, actually, I've been on regular conference calls with uh, the governor of Ohio and the governor of Kentucky and myself. And so that tri-state area has made sure that we were turning our cards face up, saying this is, this is the numbers uh, that we see in our state, respective states, and this is the responsible steps that we think that we can take, um, taking into account that things are different in Lake County or Marion County or Cass County, as is across the river or across one of our borders. So. Uh, we'll continue to make sure that, uh, and these calls are going on, by the way. We're, we're just in stage two here in the state of Indiana. And while we may differ um, with, in regards to restaurants as a statewide Indiana to Kentucky, we, we may be more aligned with where Ohio is or where another state is um, around us in the Great Lakes region. So you're never going to get us to be 100% in alignment on 100% of all the issues in all the different sectors. Uh, we've, we've been opened um, prior to today, May 4, uh, we've been opened in construction and some other areas where Kentucky hasn't been 
um, for some weeks now, or Ohio, or, or Illinois, or Michigan for that matter. And so we'll continue to have these regularly scheduled weekly phone calls uh, with governors in the Great Lakes area, including Kentucky and Ohio separately, and in addition to. Tom Davies, the Associated Press. Hello, Tom. Hello, Governor. With, uh, what is your reaction to the criticism from Dr. Woody Myers and others who argue that's too soon to be relaxing restrictions around the state, being that you're still weeks away from having the 1,000 tests per day in the contact tracing that the state has planned? Well, I'm listening to the medical and scientific experts that have been around the table looking at this 24 hours a day for the last two straight months. And we are seeing real-time data, and that's what we'll continue to factor in as we make decisions. And it won't be a uniform statewide um, decision. That's evidenced by, just to repeat myself, that's evidenced by a different approach uh, in Marion County, Lake County, and Cass County. It's, it's evidenced by a different approach for different sectors as these stages or that rolling reopening across the state of Indiana. And let, let me just say this. Um, I thought it was important. This may be one of the more forward-looking plans out in the country, as we've heard um, over the last couple days. We thought it was important to give Hoosiers a long-term look. That puts us in a position that I think is beneficial for all. That incentivizes me wearing my mask when I go pick up dinner inside a building to make sure that we know in July uh, we're informed by is it working 10 days later, 14 days later, 21 days later. It, there's a lag time there. And so as our behavior changes and opens up, uh, so will the numbers. And we need to make sure that we're still mindful of those four principles. As long as we can manage our way through this, which we have done, we know, fact certain, we have um, slowed the spread. And that's what's most importantly, that we can continue to care for those who are in need. And so when you have 80% or 44%, you said almost 81% this morning, you rounded up, I think. I like that. Uh, you know, if we're about 81% in terms of ICU beds and, and uh, vents and our uh, admittance rate into hospitals is at that level where we can manage it and care for every single person that needs care, whether it's COVID-19 or the flu or they're having heart issues or the EMS, the various runs for EMS personnel, uh, we're in a position where we can accommodate that right now. What we don't want to do is open it up uh, all at once and then be rushed and then find ourselves playing catch up and dialing it back. And oh, by the way, factoring in that come fall, we're gonna have a flu that's starting to heighten and we'll still have, as some predict, a second wave of COVID-19. And so we wanna live in reality. And to do that, we're focused on the numbers on the ground right now. And so I'll continue to uh, be completely dependent uh, on the experts that have uh, been assembled. Rob Burgess, the Wabash Plain Dealer. Oh, Rob, I've been meaning to hear from you. I almost called you. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Governor. I, I miss these talks. Well, um, con uh, congratulations before you get to your question. I understand you're a, a, a new proud papa. I am. Uh, we had our third daughter. Uh, she didn't wait to come out at the hospital, uh, so I delivered her uh, along with my wife, obviously. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, she did the hard part. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Absolutely. <laughs> I wondered why I missed you. So congratulations. Yeah. I had a good excuse at least. Yes, you did. Um, <laughs> in your plan, you stated that hair salons, barber shops, uh, nail salons, spas, and tattoo parlors are by appointment only, and employees must wear face coverings, and the workstations have to be spaced out to meet the social distancing guidelines, and the customers should wear face coverings too. Um, so I had a question from a salon owner. Uh, she said, uh, please give us some type of online certification or class we can take that gives us precise guidelines healthcare provi providers feel are appropriate. As a hairstylist, I have no healthcare background, and it's a bit unnerving to assume I am taking the proper precautions necessary. Give us direction on how to we handle things if a client informs us that they have tested positive after being in the salon. Do we close? If so, for how long? And my question is, adding on to that, if your job involves touching people like those do, how do you properly social distance from your customers? 
Yeah. Uh, Dr. Weaver, you can take the second part. I don't know if that was your oldest or your middle child, but it wasn't your your youngest, Rob, there in the background. <laughs> it um, used to be the youngest. It's Emerald, the <laughs> formerly old, youngest, yeah. now middle. <laughs> it's, it's the tweener. Uh, uh, I, I would say that the first thing, uh, we're happy to, again, answer any question um, that she or anyone else may have, but backontrack.in.gov does spell out, and it's in the back portion of that plan. It's after all the stages. Um, and, and that's where that guidance can be found. If we need to add to that, we're happy to take another look at that and see, but it gives date specific. It gives exactly what we're um, asking uh, uh, folks to do as they reopen. So it's, it's there, uh, backontrack.in.gov. And then Dr. Weaver, you want to talk about just that physical distancing when you're cutting someone's hair, or doing their nails, and the question that Rob has. Right, yeah, so exactly. So it's wearing a mask, it's having the customer wear a mask, it's washing your hands after you touch other surfaces, especially before you eat or, or touch your own mouth, um, and just taking all those proper precautions. We have a lot of information on the coronavirus.in.gov about the other things that you were asking about what if someone calls and says that they've tested positive. Additionally, that's where our contact tracers are gonna come in and help because they can help advise and, and notify the places that those people have been. And, and Rachel, I would, or Rob, I would just say that um, at that website that, that uh, Dr. Weaver just mentioned, it is a sea of information, and you can almost drown in, the, in that sea of information, but go to that, I, or go to backontrackin.gov and look at your sector-specific uh, guidelines and recommendations. It's there, and then I would encourage you to go to the website in general and look at all of the uh, effects um, that our behavior has. Julia, Wish TV. Hello, Julia. Good afternoon, Governor. I am wondering, in light of a number of large gatherings reported over the weekend here in Marion County, is the state going to provide any kind of aid to help localities enforce uh, their extended stay-at-home orders? Did, would you repeat the first part of your question, Julie? I just missed three or four words. And, and, you, and I'm wondering that in light of a, a number of large gatherings. Ah, large gatherings. Joe, you want to talk about just the, the partnership that we have with local communities, um, she's talking about large gatherings, not just here in Marion County. Like I said, it was a beautiful weekend, um, and, and we may have to take steps um, around the whole state of Indiana. This wasn't just one county. It was a beautiful weekend, and folks um, kind of lurched at the opportunity to get out and take in the fresh air, which was wonderful. Uh, but we want to make sure those large gatherings, um, that's where, as you mentioned, wearing a mask is so important, is those up-close mass gatherings where this virus... Um, um, just looks for ways to connect with people. And the more you put, the denser the area, uh, the, more, the higher probability that we have to spread it. And so we are concerned about this. Uh, we are working with our local officials, be it the mayor, Hogshead here in, in uh, Indianapolis, uh, and others around the whole state of Indiana. But again, as I said last week on Friday, before um, today, May 4th, uh, I said this was gonna take in terms of enforcement People, people in our state, 6.7 million Hoosiers will determine where we are uh, in large part um, uh, in July and in June next month. And we'll have to partner obviously with our local officials, county by county, but the brunt of the responsibility falls on me and you. And uh, we'll have the most impact on where we are and how, how this uh, virus spreads. Joe, you wanna talk about those partnerships locally? Yeah, I think the governor has, has talked about it very well. Obviously, as we implement this executive order, this new one talks about stage two. We uh, will be working with uh, local officials that have questions to make sure that the understanding of this is, is clear. In stage one, in the three counties that remain in stage one at this point are Marion, Lake, and Cass. They remain limited to 10, fewer than 10 in a public gathering for the time being. Those that move to stage two, that limit has been raised to 25. And so public gatherings, whether public or private gatherings, can now be up to 25 people. And to the extent that there are questions or issues that need to be worked through with local officials, we're ready to do that and work with them to, uh, to make sure that we comply with this as, as best possible. 
and we'll always support, as we said before, if a, if a local community wants a stricter standard, uh, and we'll complement that and uh, support that. Elizabeth Binion, PBS Michiana. Hello, Elizabeth. Good afternoon. Hello, Governor. I have a question about the business owners who are saying that they don't feel comfortable opening their business and they're not sure that their particular customers are ready to come back. Is there any kind of protection for them? Does their business interruption insurance continue? Are, are there any rent deferral options? And what happens with their employees' unemployment checks uh, and who pays that? So what kind of protection are there for them? And also if they have immunocompromised employees, uh, do those employees have some protections to make sure that they can continue to get unemployment until they are in uh, better shape in terms of the number of COVID cases in a particular county? Fred, you want to take the third part and then I'll bat clean up on the sure. first two? Sure. Yeah. In terms of the employees continue to collect unemployment, as I mentioned last week, as long as the employee is uh, continuing to be out of work due to no reason of their own and that employer hasn't opened up their business and there's no work for them, they'll continue to receive their unemployment uh, insurance benefits. Yeah, and I, and I would just say, um, Elizabeth, that as we go into this, Joe, you, you look like you want to you want me to yield the floor. You want to take a cup. You want to take a minute or so, and then I'll come up and, and do number one. I just wanted to mention that in the new executive order 20-26, there is a provision that all businesses and organizations in the state have to adhere to the following. They have to adopt before May 11th a plan to implement measures and institute safeguards to ensure a safe environment for their employees and customers. And then there is a series of things they need to do, including instituting an employee health screening process, employing enhanced cleaning and disinfecting, um, providing san hand, hand sanitizer and other uh, disinfectants, as well as complying with social distancing requirements and separation measures and wearing face coverings uh, and using barriers where possible. And so the reason I mention this is this plan needs to be posted and made available to the public, but it is also supposed to be provided to the employees of the employer. And it is really meant to show that, to provide some confidence uh, to the employees and to others that the business has a plan in place to safely move forward with reopening. And so this is one of the requirements by May 11th that businesses who intend to open or to stay open are supposed to have in place. And I think it could go a long way toward providing some confidence that what they've put in place can be helpful in controlling the situation. Yeah, and I would just, just uh, <clears throat> excuse me, to follow up, I would um, say a couple of things. One, Elizabeth, as you say, uh, don't open if you're not ready, if it's not safe. Uh, number one. Uh, number two, I've been so impressed by um, all that information that we solicited from the private sector, from the business community, and we said, if you were to reopen, how would you? They themselves put forward um, recommendations that they supported, that because they knew exactly um, the intent of your question, that is, how do we instill confidence? How do we get the uh, consumer re-engaged in our economy? And so I was flat out impressed, understanding that safety will become part of a recruiting tool with a lot of businesses. We're hearing at the Indiana Economic Development Corporation, Secretary Schellinger will give a report later this week, we're working with companies all over the state, all over the country, all over the world, who are looking for good places to invest and grow. And inside those plans, just as much as a tax or a regulatory environment, safety will be critically important. And, and Hoosiers, Americans, folks around the world will do business differently according to their level of security and the, the sense of safety that they feel whether they're um, on the ground or online. And so these are critically important questions. We're also, not to filibuster here, but we're also uh, working with the legislature upstairs. We're also working with um, the House and the Senate, our delegation in Washington, D.C., on some legal liability questions that you touch on. Some of that will be tethered to uh, legislation that has passed, and I suspect will become more uh, in the forefront of the discussions that are ongoing in Washington, D.C., as well as here in uh, the state of Indiana. 
Brandon Smith, Indiana Public Broadcasting. Good afternoon, Brandon. Afternoon, Governor. May the fourth be with you. Um, <laughs> and you. I, uh, I have a question about um, the kind of mechanics of businesses reopening, which is essentially how employers and businesses should be monitoring those capacity levels that they're supposed to adhere to. So especially as we've seen reports from other states of threats and even violence when businesses try to enforce even tougher restrictions. So essentially what my question boils down to is, do you really expect, for instance, a minimum wage worker working in a business to order people out of a store or bar them from entering? Uh, first, let me say, learn you do, Brandon. <laughs> you got it, okay. Uh, that's, a, that's a Yoda reference for folks who didn't understand Brandon's first comment. Uh, Look, I, what we expect is the business itself, not that you, you mentioned minimum wage uh, employee. What we expect is the business itself to be able to safely conduct business. And by the way, that's what consumers will expect as well. If you want to see folks turned away, uh, don't try to live up to this new standard that the coronavirus, COVID-19, has brought upon us. This is nothing that we just pulled out of the air and said, we're going to start doing businesses, business differently for no reason whatsoever. We are responding to a virus that is highly contagious, that has no vaccine or therapeutic in my mind right now. That's been, I know we're trying some and we're hopeful, um, but what we have to do is manage our ways through this. And it's going to, it's going to require businesses themselves um, and, and state government, all of us, uh, to be policing ourselves and uh, making sure that folks are, are not just sensing that, but um, living it. And, and when they go back to resuming some of those former habits in life, like um, um, going into certain retail shops or going out for dinner and actually dining out for dinner. Marianne Ahern, NBC Chicago. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you so much, Governor. I'm wondering about your positivity rate in Indiana. Where does it stand today? And if it is above 10%, the World Health Organization recommends not reopening. So can you react to that? So I think an important thing to keep in mind is that for the last, you know, several weeks over a month that we've been testing, we really have been focusing on those high risk categories. So in the beginning, it was only people who were coming into hospitals and then it was healthcare workers, long term care facilities and those people. So we expect the percentage to be much higher um, in those populations and it would be in the general public. Additionally, if we have a hot spot, for example, in, in, in one of the plants, we know that percentage is going to be much higher because those people were in close proximity to each other. So we don't believe that's a true reflection of what our actual positivity rate is in the state of Indiana. Now that we're going to have over 100 testing sites across Indiana as of Wednesday, I think we're going to be able to see a little bit more um, of what our true positivity rate is. And we, and we do think that it is um, based on some of the, the testing with the Fairbanks study, et cetera, it is below that 5% rate. Sherry with the Indianapolis Star. Good afternoon, Sherry. Good afternoon, Governor. I have a question for you about the decision to open religious institutions as basically of now um, and say that they can have gatherings from what I understand of whatever size. Is there an economic or public health rationale? Because I know some of them have, have said, have elected to say, no, we're, we're still not going to meet like the Carmel Interfaith Alliance. Yeah. Uh, until this is over. Well, I think that's a a good decision on their part. If they're questioning um, whether they can adequately or successfully physically distance and all the hygiene that goes on uh, with it during a service, they're, they're making the right decision. Um, I can also say that when I mentioned last week that this was, I said a little bit about science and a little bit about art or a balance thereof, it's a lot about science and a little bit of art. And when it came down to making the ultimate decision on places of worship, we said going forward that we would recommend allowing this now to see um, as we look back 14 days or 21 days in terms of um, houses of worship, uh, what effect it might have. If we can manage this, this gives us a lot of confidence in some other uh, arenas as well. Um, and so what we're gonna do is learn from 
these steps that we're taking. And uh, we just thought a good place to start or a good place to um, have a, a, a test or a control group would be houses of worship, that these would be the absolute, in my mind, most responsible. But I did say uh, that we needed those church leaders uh, to be responsible for their con congregations. We can prove that we can do this, and um, I think that we'll see just that. Joe, did you want to add anything specifically to, from a more legal or constitutional perspective in terms of the order? Yes, I, I would just add to uh, what the governor has said that, that the one thing that has changed is really the lifting of the number of people who could attend a religious service. And I think it's important to talk about religious service. In fact, I think the preference would be that that be limited to traditional worship services. And um, there's really three things here that I think are important that stay in place. One is we still encourage the use of virtual services, especially for those at risk. Uh, we uh, obviously you still have to have inside the the chapel or the facility social distancing and sanitation Even though the the number has been lifted you still have to have that and then as the governor said uh, obviously counting on religious leaders to um, To do what's necessary to protect the people and in, that are part of their congregation and part of their organizations, but again, this is a, a and I also want to point this out when it comes to receptions and visitations before or after religious services, those do remain subject to the public gathering limitation of 25 people. And so there is a di difference between religious services and, and the public gathering aspect of it. And again, this is something that, that we felt was appropriate under the circumstances and felt that it was, uh, would be good to implement, as the governor said, for the reasons um, he said. Thank you. Michael WBEZ. Afternoon, Michael. Oh, thank you. Uh, sorry about that. I had to uh, unmute the, the phone. Uh, Governor, uh, Porter County is reopening today. Lake County is not. What advice do you give to this area that are so interconnected and separated really by just a line on County Line Road? Also, what's the timeline and plan to reopen casinos around the state, including Northwest Indiana? Yeah, second, second question first. Um, as I mentioned at the outset, we, we solicited information and input from various sectors. I think there were 17 at the outset. We received more than that. Uh, casinos as well. We're still going to work with this sector, uh, with this industry, uh, gaming industry, as the days ahead unfold. We want to make sure that we get this right, and this will be down the road. We contemplated this. Um, I think it was in stage three. I can, I can reference this, but we, we have casinos closed in stage three, cl still closed in stage four. Um, but after that, we're going to be also, not just with, uh, in this area, looking for some guidance from the CDC uh, to make an informed decision. So we'll be in a different place just as the calendar unfolds to make this decision. Uh, we'll have some more input in terms of casinos, and then we'll also be of, uh, have the benefit of, of learning some guidance from the CDC in this particular area. Uh, to, to ward your uh, first question, yes, uh, the virus doesn't know any lines in, it, in, it, in terms of spread. Um, we do have some travel restrictions, uh, had some in place. Uh, whether it be in Illinois or different parts of the country or in different parts of our, of our border surrounding the state of Indiana that would have, a, have an impact on our numbers um, as well. But, it, but what we did with Lake County is we said, because of that potential, we wanted to make sure as our testing ramped up and our tracing ramps up, that's going to give us more information. And that's why Marion specifically and Lake specifically uh, were delayed. As, as opposed to um, uh, most of the state in terms of 90, 89 counties taking out CAS. Um, and, and that's why we've said what happens on the other side of the border, obviously we're mindful of, we're looking at, it factors in, um, and, and why we decided to delay Lake County. Whitney Downard, CNHI. Hello, Whitney. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Governor. My question is, we were talking for a couple of weeks about preparing for a peak, you know, when we would estimate to see a peak, 
but we've never really discussed where that when that peak is now and if we've actually hit that peak and that's why we're de-escalating. So can we talk a little bit more about that peak specifically? It's a great question for Dr. Lindsay because I use the word peak a lot and now they're using where we are on the plateau. Uh, so it is a uh, terminology is important here, but you want to talk about where we are um, in terms of the numbers and those four principles that tells us where we are on the plateau or on the curve. Right, exactly. So when we first began looking at this and we did modeling and, and predictions that we talked about a lot, looking for that peak, um, and that's what we were looking for. And that was based on the information that we had from other countries and from other states about what the project projection of their cases looked like. Because of all the hard work that we put in Indiana, we never really saw that big spike. And in fact, it, it went up and then it is leveled off and is even kind of going down. So that is what we're gonna continue to watch um, over the next weeks and months to make sure that everything continues to keep that nice level plateau. Kevin Reader, WTHR. Hello, Kevin. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, all of you. That last question kind of got into what I was going to delve into because I heard Dr. Weaver say the testing sites will let us know what our true positivity rate will be. So at that point, are we making a decision on a weekly basis as to whether we roll back then? I mean, does that mean all every all rules are off at that point? No, uh, I'll let you I'll let you weigh in on that. But no, I mean we we I tend to look at this in three day to a week increments just to see kind of the the incline or the plateau or the decline. Um, but no, the, our staged approach, whether it be May four or May eight or May eleven or June thirteenth or July fourth wherever we are on that, we're looking at the information every single day. If something jumps out at us and we can trace it back a week ago or 10 days ago and see how our actions affected, had a, had a reaction, um, then we'll have to factor in that, um, those facts as, as we go um, forward. But certainly having more testing, Dr. Weaver mentioned, you know, thinking about where we came from at the very outset with Thankfully, we had uh, Lilly and IU Health and the state of Indiana partnering together to do some testing, and then we added in our strike teams, and then we added in the drive-throughs. Um, so we're up in one of those is East Chicago today, I think. Um, but we've been in Gary, and we've been in Maryville, up in just that region with a drive-through, and in other quadrants, all other quadrants of our state, uh, with those drive-throughs. And then you layer on top of that the Fairbanks study, and then you layer on top of that now this 100,000 in a month testing ability, and that's just in the first month. And so we'll be, Dr. Box mentioned some weeks ago uh, that she'd like to get at about 6,800 tests a day, have that capability. Now we need folks um, uh, to, to step forward. If they're feeling symptomatic or have been around someone who's symptomatic uh, or they're a frontline worker, we need folks to take advantage of getting tested. That's one thing I do want to put out there today, that if you fall into one of those three categories, um, we're going to have, we have the ability right now uh, to test to get that true picture. And, uh, and then in terms of the tracing, that kind of that follow-up and having 500 folks trained um, tracers on the ground, connecting all the dots community by community. Um, this, this is, Kevin, what um, will all factor into the decisions we make on a daily basis. You want to add to that from a medical perspective? Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with everything that you said, that there are so many data points that are coming into this, and it's something that we talk about on a regular basis and every single day. So we can have access every day. What are our hospitalizations? How many events are we currently using? We look at the EMS data and see, is this a corona-like illness that people are going to the hospital for, or are they going for trauma or other things? So we take all of those data points in mind, and if we see something to start to go up or to start to change, we'll watch it for a couple of days, we can talk to the people in the community. We're in constant contact with each region. So we really know not only what are we looking at data-wise and the numbers, but we're talking to the people that are actually seeing that. So we can be pretty confident in the decisions that we make going forward. Nikki Kelly, the Fort Wayne Journal-Gazette. Afternoon, Nikki. Good afternoon, Governor. Um, I had two quick questions. First is I was confused on your guidance for masks. In stage five, it says masks are optional. In the other stages, it says they're recommended, which mean the same thing to me. So I wanted to clarify that. 
And also, why did you not uh, follow President Trump's guidance of 14 days of declining cases? Yeah. Uh, you might want to take the second one, and, or I can. Uh, I stand corrected, Nikki. Uh, you, you, you're probably speaking for a lot of other folks who are to interpret uh, those two words to be very similar in meaning. Uh, but I'll just say at the end of the day, uh, we could probably put recommended slash optional on both. It is recommended because uh, that is our counsel. That is our advice. We know that that's the safest route to go. Uh, in terms of wearing a mask and doing your part not to potentially spread if you're asymptomatic uh, and you don't know. Um, uh, it's optional because you get to choose. I mean, it's up to you. We're not saying it's absolute, it's you have to uh, at the end of the day. We're just saying that our best counsel, medically speaking, is that it's the safest route to take. You want to take the second part of her question? Yeah, so for the second part of the question of declining cases um, over 14 days, again, that's just one data point. And as we test more people, we do expect to see more positives. And so as I mentioned earlier, we have up to 113,000 people tested. That's a lot of people. And with each day and the more testing sites we have, that means we're going to test more people and expect to see maybe see that number go up. But at the same time, we're looking at all those other data pieces and saw that our hospitalizations had um, flattened out, started to decrease. Client, our EMS runs had done the same. We were talking to our frontline workers, and they have felt comfortable that things had gotten better over time. So it's just one of the small pieces when you start to make these kind of decisions. Kayla Sullivan, Fox 59. Hello, Kayla. Hi, Governor. So I'm going to take another crack at my daycare question because I don't think I was specific enough last week. So some states like California are repurposing schools as pop-up daycares for parents going back to work. Are we considering this? And if not, why? What's available to Hoosier families who may not have access to childcare right now because of the increased need and closure of schools? Great question and something that uh, Secretary Sullivan is passionate about. Hi, Jen Sullivan, Secretary of Indiana Family and Social Services Administration. Indiana has also used school facilities as pop-up daycare sites. We also have done emergency licensing for other daycare sites that are close to businesses that have been deemed essential throughout the response. The guidance around that was built in partnership with the Department of Education. We have nearly 40 of those pop-up sites open now across the state of Indiana, in addition to the additional child cares that have remained open throughout. We will continue through each of the stages to support reopening of child cares as Hoosiers go back to work so that they can go back to work <coughs> safely and supported. We also have made the Child Care Development Fund much more flexible to account for sick days for workers who may be affected with COVID-19 or other illnesses during this time so that they won't lose those voucher benefits in this really important and critical moment. Thank you. Thank you. Our final question is from Lindsay Erdoti of the Indianapolis Business Journal. Hello, Lindsay. Good afternoon. Hello, Governor. Uh, I'm curious with this COVID-19 action plan that businesses have to create, uh, I know that it says that they, most, they must post it online and share it with their employees, but is there any sort of accountability to that? You know, what happens if a business doesn't do that? Yeah. And on, along similar lines, some of these safety suggestions are just that, they're suggestions. So what happens if a company isn't screening employees or providing hand sanitizer, for example? Yep. Joe, you want to talk about enforcement? So the enforcement provisions in the executive order that have been in place now for over a month, they would apply to this situation as well. And so to the extent that uh, we would receive complaints or information that employers were not doing these things, th that would be looked into by the en enforcement team. And, uh, and if in fact there was a, uh, a violation, they would have a verbal warning first and then it would escalate from there. But that's the same process we have in place for retail and other parts of the executive order and the same thing would apply in this situation. And Joe, you might want to, just if I could, you might yes. want to just build into maybe Thursdays before Fred gives his report at DWD, just the, what's been filed in terms of how the PLA, how IOSHA, et cetera, and our follow-up uh, numbers on a weekly yeah. basis so, we, so Lindsay and, and others know. Thank you. Thank you for joining today's briefing. Governor Holcomb's next briefing. 
You've been watching Governor Eric Holcomb's update on the Indiana coronavirus response. The state's death toll tragically is now 1,151, more than a third of those coming from some of the nursing homes and uh, extended living facilities in the state. Today's briefing focused at the start on the Bureau of Motor Vehicles, an update from them where Hoosiers can now make appointments uh, to uh, have their, they have extended hours at the Bureau of Motor Vehicles. Uh, 20,000 Hoosiers have made appointments already. They do anticipate to be fully functioning by the time of the Indiana primary when many Hoosiers will have to have uh, some sort of valid ID. Uh, they did point out, the BMV points out, that expiration dates have been extended for licenses and also for license plates. The governor also talked about uh, the controversy surrounding a photo that was taken this weekend in Brown County, which showed him not wearing a mask, also so not uh, doing social distancing. Uh, the governor called that an unforced error. He took full responsibility for it and said that no one has been harder on him than himself. Uh, the governor also took questions about listening to the experts opening up the state. This was in response to some criticism that he's faced about why they are opening up the state in stages at this point when uh, the number of cases, the number of deaths are still rising. Um, they uh, say they have slowed the spread, but they did mention that businesses should not open if they're not ready. The uh, state officials saying that they are looking at other data points, such as hospitalizations, as justification for opening right now. We have much more on all these issues, all these updates from the governor. It's coming up on CBS 4 News at 5 and 6, and right now on the CBS 4 Indy News app. But for now, let's head back to our regular programming.